Good morning. We start with general questions. And the first question is from Jenny Gilruth. Uh, can I start by reminding members I'm the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary for Education to ask the Scottish Government what steps it has taken to close the attainment gap. Minister Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government has committed £750 million during the course of this Parliament through the Attainment Scotland Fund to provide targeted support for children, schools and communities to close a poverty-related attainment gap. In 2017-18, £120 million will be allocated directly to headteachers on the basis of numbers of pupils in primary one to secondary three known to be eligible and registered for free school meals at a rate of £1,200 per pupil. This funding is on top of the existing £50 million Attainment Scotland funding that will continue to provide targeted support to specific Scottish Attainment Challenge authorities and schools in the communities with high levels of deprivation, as well as a number of national programmes. Jenny Gilruth. I uh, thank the Minister for that response. Uh, across the water, in the glorious Kingdom of Fife, the Labour Party is proposing to cut 100 frontline teaching staff from our schools. In Leaven, they plan to cut speech and language provision in Mount Fleury Primary School. And in 2015, they closed Tansall Primary School in Glenrothes. Does the Minister agree with me that it's high time the Labour Party got their act together when it comes to closing the attainment gap and put kids before Labour's cuts? Yeah. Minister. Well, I would, uh, I would certainly share in uh, revelling in the glory of Fife with uh, Jenny uh, Gilruth. What I would, uh, of course, recognise is that uh, these are decisions directly for uh, Fife uh, Council, but at a time when we are seeking to make progress to further close the attainment gap, when we are working together with local authorities towards that end through the Developing Young Workforce uh, Strategy. And we have uh, provided uh, some uh, funding through the Innovation Fund, Schools Programme, Pupil Equity Fund of uh, around £11 million to Fife. It shows that we are certainly up for the uh, challenge of uh, reducing the attainment gap in Fife, just as we are across the country. But that will, of course, require uh, all our partners to work with us towards that end. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister, at yesterday's Education Committee, serious concerns were raised by a number of professionals for additional support for learning, making it clear that there are weaknesses within the teacher training for additional support. Could I ask what the Scottish Government is doing to address these concerns? Minister. Well, of course, we are uh, investing in a range of, of activities to support the uh, upskilling and training of uh, professional teachers across uh, the country. We've seen uh, a significant increase in the intake uh, this year. We'll continue to invest in that area and if any concerns are brought to our attention about specific uh, areas then it's incumbent on us uh, to look at that and of course we'll look at any evidence the education committee gathers. Question number two, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what evaluation has been made of its previous suicide prevention strategy and how this will underpin its updated mental health strategy. Minister Maureen Wood. No formal evaluation has been made of the suicide prevention strategy 2013-16. However, over the last three years, the Scottish Government's Suicide Prevention Implementation and Monitoring Group met on seven occasions and advised on progress with the various commitments. Adjustments have been made as appropriate to actions arising from the commitments in light of this discussion and advice. The engagement process for the mental health strategy included discussion about suicide prevention. We have also undertaken some engagement with key stakeholders from the NHS, the third sector and academia to help inform areas to focus upon in a future suicide prevention strategy or action plan. We therefore have evidence from these processes about stakeholders' views on suicide prevention. Later in 2017, we will undertake some wider engagement in order to allow stakeholders the opportunity to feed in their views. Alex Colhampton. I thank the Minister for that answer. This Chamber will be well aware that suicide still represents the leading cause of death in men under the age of 50 in Scotland. Nearly 15 years have passed since the Choose Life, in Life initiative was launched and that saw an 18% reduction in suicides in this country. It shows that policy focus can have a positive impact in this area. To this end, can the Minister indicate when the last suicide prevention strategy, which expired last year, will be replaced and what measures it might contain? Minister. Well, as I indicated uh, in my answer, we do continue to monitor uh, the effectiveness of the current uh, suicide prevention strategy, which of course uh, continues until um, a new one is published. As the member is aware, at the moment we're concentrating on the mental health strategy, but as I said in my answer, we will review the current uh, suicide prevention strategy in due course. Keith Gibson. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. From 2011 to 2015, the rate of suicide in NHS Ayr Shanann, Grampian and Tayside were significantly lower than in the rest of Scotland, while in Lothian and Highland suicide rates were significantly higher. This is even when deprivation and other factors were considered. Can I ask the Minister if the reasons why these differences occurred have been examined in order that lessons learned can help to reduce suicide rates elsewhere in Scotland? Minister. Well, um, I thank Kenny Gibson for his question. As he knows, suicide is a very complex phenomenon with a wide range of determinants. Any assessment of difference between rates of suicide in local areas must be treated with caution, because in local areas, the absolute numbers are much smaller, obviously, than national numbers. Uh, we are investing in research such as the Scottish Suicide Information Database, which is helping to cast new light on factors behind individual deaths by suicide. This includes consideration of suicide trends in local NHS board areas. This research will help inform our engagement later this year on future priorities for suicide prevention. Provision of services, as the member knows, is a local responsibility and individual NHS boards work with their partners to tailor local suicide prevention work to fit locally assessed needs and circumstances. Anna Sauer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There is clearly a link between deprivation and suicide rates. So what work is the government doing to tackle inequality in Scotland, which is rising in the last 10 years? And secondly, follow on from Alec Cole Hamilton's question, you are three times as likely to commit suicide if you are a male, but only half as likely to access mental health services. So how can we get the message across uh, to the most deprived communities and also to the hardest to reach males to access those vital services? Minister. Um, well, as the member knows, across government, we are doing all we can to uh, reduce uh, inequality. And certainly that is a key uh, factor in the, uh, uh, in the health um, um, department and directorate. Uh, in terms of the hard to reach um, people, uh, that is why it is important that provision of services is a local responsibility so that local partners can work to fit the needs of their local communities. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister has recognised that there is a need to refresh local suicide prevention action around the country. So can she update to Parliament um, how local suicide prevention schemes will be supported as the national strategy is developed? Maureen Ward. Um, well, uh, um, as the member indicates, um, I, I am aware of uh, the um, MSPs, including myself, having had a number of uh, emails on uh, this particular issue and that obviously will be taken into account uh, when we develop the next strategy. Question number three, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with retail banks regarding branch networks. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, Scottish Government Ministers meet regularly with the retail banks to discuss a wide range of issues, including branch closures. I appreciate Mr Gray's concerns over the closures recently announced in his own constituency, which will have an undoubted impact on local communities. Those concerns are shared uh, by many as banks continue to change the way they choose to deliver services to their customers, albeit we also recognise the shift over to digital banking is having a significant impact on the footfall in some branches. While we recognise declining branch activity may be a driver for banks today, we would urge banks to avoid acting precipitately and to see branch closures as a last resort and before closing a branch uh, to consider consultation with local stakeholders and communities to explore all practical options to retain a branch where viable to do so and to consider alternatives to reflect the needs of many customers who have a strong preference or indeed need uh, for face-to-face -face contact. Ian Gray. Uh, I Indeed, uh, Preston Pans in my constituency recently uh, lost its last bank, an RBS branch, uh, and now nearby Trinent uh, is down to one bank uh, with the TSB closing their branch there. Uh, I do appreciate, uh, as the Minister made clear, these decisions are, are not in the control of government. But can I ask the Minister and his colleagues to take every opportunity to perhaps go a little further than he did in his answer and impress on these banks that they benefited from a great deal of public money and the public deserves better in return. Minister. Well, I very much, much recognise Ian Gray's point that uh, there, that's a point that's been made to me by a number of members and I know Ian Gray has been uh, proactive on this issue. I know 
Kenneth Gibson and other members in the chamber have raised similar issues in their own constituency. So I, I give an undertaking to Ian Gray that I will, and indeed other members across the chamber who have expressed a, an interest in this area, to, to work uh, with the banks to identify what we can do uh, to tackle this challenge. We do have to recognise there are fundamental changes taking place in banking, but I would hope that we can also find ways to try and preserve branches where possible and to work uh, both, both UK government, Scottish government, indeed working together to try and make sure uh, where reserve powers intervene here that we have the right environment to protect branches. Uh, but I do take the point entirely that uh, branches which have significant public stake in them, uh, controlled by UK government, uh, could do more perhaps to protect the branch network. Question number four, Gillian Martin. Thank you. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to assist people in the oil and gas industry who are facing redundancy. Minister Paul Wheelers. The Scottish Government has done everything it can to minimise redundancies in the oil and gas industry, but where this has not been possible, we have supported affected employees through our initiative for responding to redundancy situations, the Partnership for Action on, for Continuing Employment, or PACE, which has focused significant efforts in the North East, with four large events attended by around 3,500 people. A fifth employment support event will take place in Aberdeen on the 29th of March. Furthermore, the Energy Jobs Task Force has brought together key partners to maximise employment opportunities, and we've set up a £12 million transition training fund that has so far enabled more than 1,600 former oil and gas workers to receive uh, support for training from the fund. Training programmes procured by the fund uh, will look to create 755 employment opportunities through two procurement rounds, and the fund is also supporting 12 individuals to retrain as teachers in STEM subjects in the North East. Gillian Martin. Thank the Minister for that answer. Recently I found evidence that many companies are not even considering giving interviews to applicants that have come from an oil and gas background. Since I revealed this evidence publicly, I've been inundated with emails from constituents and workers all over Scotland who say they've actually felt discriminated against. I've contacted the UK Employment Secretary about this over a month ago have had no response to my request for guidance and action. Can the Minister outline for me the Scottish Government's response to this issue? Issue, which is affecting many skilled people genuinely wishing to move into other sectors for employment. Yes, sir. Well, uh, it's deeply concerning uh, to, to hear these uh, reports that people are being discriminated against. Now, certainly, uh, I think it's absolutely right that Gillian Martin has raised this with UK government ministers who clearly have responsibility in this area. I am very disappointed that, uh, although, although not entirely surprised, I have to say that Gillian Martin has not yet received a response uh, to her uh, correspondence. But if Gillian Martin would be willing to, to uh, get permission from those who have provided that information to share that with myself, I, I would certainly undertake to take this issue up uh, with my colleague Jamie Hepburn as well and with UK ministers to make sure that we uh, take this further. Uh, we are fully committed for our own part in the Scottish Government to uh, promoting fair work practices throughout Scotland and we will continue uh, to lobby the UK Government for full set of powers around employment law in order that this Parliament, uh, regardless of party, this Parliament can adapt a, uh, adopt a more proactive role in addressing exactly the kind of issues that Gillian Martin has raised on behalf of her constituents. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. The Minister will know that John MacDonald, the Interim Chief Executive of OPITO, gave evidence to the Scottish Affairs Committee last week in Aberdeen uh, about, in particular, the Scottish Government's approach to the uh, apprenticeship levy in relation to the oil and gas industry and raised concern of the un unintended consequence of the Scottish Government's approach might be to incentivise oil companies to conduct training in England rather than in Scotland because of the different way in which the levy will apply. Given his evidence and his call for a rethink by the Scottish Government, will the Minister give an undertaking today to carry out such a rethink? Yes. Well, I, I certainly uh, would first want to put on record our concern, which I, I know my colleague Jamie Hepburn has mentioned a number of times in this chamber, that we were not consulted on the imposition of the apprenticeship levy, which clearly has a big impact on major employers in Scotland. And that, that was a fundamental uh, failure, I think, of the part of the UK government to engage the Scottish government in its responsibilities. But I do take uh, on board the point, this very serious point, that uh, we, we need to make sure that we have sufficient support for oil and gas employers in training. I know there has been very good engagement between uh, Mr Hepburn and Opito, but I certainly will continue my own dialogue with OP2 and, and indeed Mr Hepburn as to how we can uh, ensure that the, the training packages that are available for the oil and gas industry are as good as they can be. But I would point out that the funding which came with the apprenticeship levy uh, announcement was merely replacing funding uh, in the block grant and clearly that is a concern to us that this is not new funding and therefore uh, again uh, why it's such a failure on the part of the UK government not to consult the Scottish government in the first place. Question number five, Gail Ross. 
Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it works with rural community councils to develop community empowerment, devolve powers locally and help reform local government. Mr Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. It always has to be remembered that the statutory oversight and responsibility for community councils rests with local authorities. That said, the Government welcomes the approach of those community councils who already undertake a wide range of roles and activities for the benefit of their communities. Over recent times, the Government has been working with COSLA, the Improvement Service uh, and Edinburgh Napier University to support community councils in their role across Scotland. In addition, the Community Empowerment Act will create opportunities for communities and community councils to enter into dialogue with public authorities about local issues and local services on their terms. And through our Community Choices programme, we have been supporting communities and community councils in the Highlands and across Scotland to be able to make decisions on local spending priorities. Neil Ross. I thank the Minister for that answer. I note in my own constituency of Caithness, Sutherland and Ross, many communities feel on the periphery of decision making by councils. And whilst there has been progress made in terms of participatory budgeting, Many rural communities in my constituency feel that their voices are not being heard by those in the Council. And can I ask if there are any plans for a more proactive approach for these communities from the Scottish Government in future? Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I thank uh, Ms Ross for her question and I'm really pleased that she referred to the use of participatory budgeting, uh, which is the potential to make a, a real and positive contribution uh, to communities' involvement in decision making. Um, I'd like to, to point to the Chamber the ambitious programme uh, that took place in Kinyan and Yell and Shear and Barra in the US. So a half a million pound budget uh, was up uh, for decision making by the community there and I would like other authorities uh, to follow suit. Uh, further, we set our intentions to decentralise local authority functions budgets and to de democratise oversight to local communities uh, and to review local government in our programme for government. Uh, and we continue to work with local government to develop the scope and the timing of that review. Question number six, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact would be on the fishing industry of the UK Government considering it a medium priority in its negotiations on leaving the EU as suggested in a recently leaked Memo. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Hugh. Uh, Presiding Officer, I've asked UK ministers repeatedly for an assurance that Scotland's fishing industry will not be expendable as they were in the 1970s. UK ministers have failed to give such a guarantee. This mem memo, if indeed it is genuine, serves only to increase my concern that once again the UK government is not taking seriously the importance of the fishing industry to Scotland. And it also indicates why it's vital that Scotland is fully involved in all negotiations relating to Scotland's future in Europe. Scottish waters are amongst the most valuable in Europe and with the right management and policy approach to support both offshore and onshore interests, they can help us build growth in Scotland's rural and coastal communities. Stuart Stevenson. Um, can I uh, further ask the Cabinet Secretary, or in the light of the silence from the UK uh, Secretary of State, I suspect I know the answer, uh, whether any guarantees have been given about uh, funding levels that support fishing communities and that are a very important part of the support that flows from the current arrangements with the EU? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, last... Uh, week uh, myself and colleagues met with Andrea Leadsom and uh, her fellow UK ministers. Uh, I can't say what she said at that meeting because of the rules under which it was conducted, but I am able to state that uh, I asked for an assurance that the pre-referendum pledges made by Andrea Leadsom and George Eustace that EU funding of £500 million a year to our rural economy would be matched those were the pre-referendum pledges. Since the referendum, presiding officer, there has been radio silence. I specifically asked Andrea Leadsom to confirm that she would match her pledge, her unequivocal pledge, that the UK government will match the funding of the EU. Uh, presiding officer, we are still waiting for a reply 
But of course, we shall fight and fight again for a fair deal for Scotland's fishermen. And that's why uh, we will fight to prevent them being sold out now as they were in the 1970s when it emerged after the referendum that an internal memo in Whitehall said that the Conservatives regarded the Scottish fishing interests as, quotes, expendable. Finlay Carson. In light of the Cabinet Secretary's previous answer, can I ask him, is the Scottish Government in favour of Scotland remaining a part of the common fisheries policy? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have put forward our alternative paper, Scotland's Place in Europe. Uh, where we would be able to come out of the common fisheries policy. Sadly, presiding officer, well, that's in our paper. I suggest you read it. You might educate yourselves. Sadly, the UK government, uh, despite Mr Russell's frequent meetings with Mr Davis, have said precisely nothing whatsoever in response to that very serious paper, which sets out proposals that would protect Scotland's interests and make clear the importance of single, mem single market membership to our economy, uh, as well as that we would not be happy to remain constrained by the CFP uh, as an acceptable option outside